This episode of the Beancast is brought to you by the all-new Prezi for Business. Life's too short to sit through boring presentations. Start your free two-week trial and see how Prezi can help your team avoid death by PowerPoint. Visit www.prezi.com slash beancast today. Also by Brandfolder. Brandfolder is the solution for managing your digital brand assets. Start your free 90-day trial today at brandfolder.com slash beancast. Bandwidth provided by Recursive Squirrel Interactive. Video conferencing provided by Pluot.co. Episode 480, Do You Know Me? Monday, January 22nd, 2018. It's time for this week's edition of The Beancast, a weekly discussion about the news and issues facing marketers today. I'm your host, Bob North. Thanks for joining us. The advertising model is the backbone of much of the technology world and more startups keep entering the space using the model each week. But is there a point of overload where the entire space implodes? And is it happening already? Tonight, we'll discuss. Also, how the blockchain is evolving identity online, whether YouTube is killing niche players, why the NFL may determine the future of television, plus this week's AdFell 5. That's the lineup. Let's meet tonight's panel. Thanks for joining us for this week's Beancast. I'm Bob Norp, and with me on the panel for this evening, we start with author and freelance marketing consultant, Mr. Dan Goldgeier is here. Dan, welcome back. Thanks for having me back on the show, Bob. It's always a pleasure. My pleasure. Now, also with us, we have the chief marketing officer for WTO Group, Mr. Aaron Strout joins us. Hi, Aaron. Hey, Bob. Good to be back. And finally, we have the Executive Vice President, Audience Science for Viacom. Say hello once again to Mr. Julian Zilberbrand. Julian. Thanks for having me back, sir. Happy to be here. Well, I love having this panel because it's a really strong one, especially for the topics we're going to be covering for this evening. And first up, while the agency networks have their share of struggles, investors as a whole are still pretty bullish on advertising as a model for profitability. Uh, After all, Facebook is over 90% ad supported and nobody's questioning that Facebook is a strong player. Google is over 80% ad supported and no one's questioning Google. We've got an ad and marketing market and CRM tech market that's blowing the roof off their profit expectations. But I got to ask, and this is for the whole panel, is this going to be a dark side that's going to be coming up pretty soon? Aaron, I'm going to start with you. Are we reaching a point where ad-supported models exceed the abilities for brands to fund it and even consumers to parse it? What's your, what's your thoughts on this over-enthusiasm, especially in the investment community, over ad-supported models? So I'll start by saying I, I tend to agree with you. Uh, because I think that we are a little irrationally exuberant, as our uh, president, what was it, two or three presidents ago, said about the economy. But that said, I am actually bullish, and I've said this a few times before, and ironic for a guy that's a CMO and working at an agency, that I love the shift that we're seeing right now from traditional television and cable and radio over to Things like Facebook and Google, soon to be Amazon, which we'll talk about, podcasts, which are enjoying a huge resurgence. And the the reason I love it is, and I think this is why it's actually getting a little exuberant, is the ability to target is unprecedented. Now, that can be dangerous. There are a lot of people that do not like the big brother element. I am a believer, and this is what I've said on some of your previous shows, is that if there's the right value exchange, and I think Facebook still does this pretty well, I'll argue that Instagram, which is part of Facebook, does this exceptionally well then people do not mind because you will get ads that are much more customized to your likes and needs. And so as a result, I, I think that there's a reason that we should be more excited than ever about this. Now, let me, let me caveat that by saying, yes, I agree with you that there is great uh, benefit in the way that digital advertising can be served up and the way that it can work. 
I think the the problem comes into play when you have so many m- new businesses coming out that are totally ad supported. It's almost like there's so much need for ad support for all these different technologies that are coming down the pike. And yet at the same time, there's only a, a finite number of people who need to use advertising. You know, So you put this incredible strain on the system by putting more and more of the GDP in the in the advertising space, um, it, it, does that bother anybody? I mean, Julian, any any thoughts on that? Is, is that a, a problem that we're kind of making for ourselves going down the line? Well, I, I think that to a degree that there definitely is a, a concern as too many companies coming in with that model. Having said that, um, I think there is plenty of of money to go around. Uh, and I do think as TV becomes more addressable, because certainly that's where that's going, uh, it'll kind of circle back in and of itself to kind of be the dominant form of advertising, um, starting to kind of take some share back away from Google and Facebook. And that will open up, I think, some other scenarios and businesses to kind of spread out the advertising volume. So I, I do think that there's enough to go around and and there's enough businesses that come in. And when you think about national advertisers versus local advertisers and all the other opportunities that, that you know, technology is presenting in the space, I, I think that, you know, the, the economy can manage on an ad supported model. But I do think that consumers uh, have to go along for the ride. And right about now, um, I'm not sure that that's going to be the case. Uh, we'll have to see how that plays itself out. That For me, that's the big, big if is whether or not consumers can go on for the ride because, mm-hmm. you know, advertising effectiveness is going down, down, down because there's so much ad glut and it's harder and harder and harder for advertising to break through the clutter. There's just so many ads and so much demand on brands to provide the, the money to fuel this growth. So let me... Let me ask you, Dan, what's your thoughts on this? Are you in agreement? Are you bullish on the advertising space as a model? Or are you thinking that maybe advertising as a whole might need to have a, a reality check of sorts? Well, I think we're, I think we're due for a, a, a correction generally in, in the economy. I think that's going to come in the next couple of years. When you talk about uh, all these networks that or all the people who are dependent on advertising, this is the dilemma we've had forever. You know, if you want services, somebody has to pay for it. Somebody has to support that. You know, Facebook right now for me is free. Most of Google is what I use is is free. Somebody's got to pay for it. And and so that's the that's the value exchange we've always had as consumers. Um and if consumers But that's a value decide- that's a value exchange. Yeah, that's the value exchange we've always had. But consumers are not able, let, let alone willing, to uphold their end of the bargain anymore. I mean, well, they expect everything to be exactly free. That's exactly why there may be a course correction coming in the next couple of years. If if more people turn on ad blockers, more people say, I don't want this intrusiveness, you know, never mind how well targeted these advertising, uh, these ads can be, I don't want that, then you're going to see a, uh, a, you know, a pullback. Then companies will uh, have trouble, you know, maintaining profitability. Well, I think the other ch- the other challenge is going to be, you know, there's only a finite amount of money in a person's wallet, and not everything can be subscription based, and not yep. everything is worth a subscription, and yep. so the demand for content has gone up, not gone down, and I think it's going to continue to go up, um, therefore kind of allowing for a potential, you know, um, you know, flourishing advertising market, but it is dependent on kind of shifting away from what is a traditional ad unit and really being creative about how marketers are using advertising. You know, Julian, I think that's going to be the key. Julian, there's one thing you say about, you know, demand for content is going up, and that's the conventional wisdom. I mean, the data seems to support that consumers want more and more content. But is that really the case? Do they want more content or do they just want more content choices and they're not really consuming all that much more content as a whole. They just have more subscriptions and they have more you know, channels that they can tune into uh, via either digital methods or traditional methods. And what does that do to the state of the economy if you know, there's this demand for lots of choice but not actual eyeballs and ears showing up to consume the content? Well, l- last time I checked, the population keeps going up. <laughs> um, so, you know, as long as the population keeps going up, I think we're, we're, we're okay in that matter. 
Yeah, Aaron, what's your take on all of this, you know, within that perspective? I mean, you gave a good framework to start this discussion, but you've listened to the other guys here. What, what's, your, what's your take on the situation of overload that's going on? And can the ad-supported model continue in the way it's doing, or is there a course correction coming up in your opinion? It's a good question. I, I don't know about the course correction. What I will say is, I think if we looked back, you know, 20 years ago, and anyone had mentioned anything like Facebook or Amazon or Google or, you know, any of the platforms, Snap, um, I don't think we ever would have guessed that advertising would have swung into that. I think we started to see a swing a little bit more towards digital, but we knew that it was not good. I do agree that I think with uh, all of the access now, uh, you know, I, I geek out a little bit about the mobile stuff. And so there are more smartphones than ever in the world. People are digesting more content than ever, TV, reading, podcasts. And so I think what they are looking for is they are probably, you know, digesting it in smaller bursts. So there is sort of a you're taking in more pieces of content per day. They just happen to be smaller pieces. And especially post-election, people are looking for better quality content. And I would say not just news, but I think all across the board, you know, things like podcasts or if you're, you know, reading a book, making sure it's a really good book because there's just so many choices now. So I look at it as this is Darwinian. It's the way things have always worked. It, it has a way of working itself out and the things that, you know, are of value to people, they're going to continue to be of value to people. And the ones that aren't of value, they're going to fall to the wayside, kind of like uh, MySpace did. I mean, I know it's still around, but not in the same way it looked like it was going to come out of the gates. You know, uh, go ahead. I was going to say, if, if you look at if you look at how kids are growing up these days, right, they're growing up from almost infancy in the content consumption environment. Parents giving kids smartphones at one, two, three, four years old to play games or whatever it is. Whereas like, you know, when you were, you know, when you were a child at 10 years old, you're outside playing. Well, kids today aren't outside playing. They're consuming content. And that behavior is just going to continue to manifest itself as those people turn into adolescents and young adults and so on and so forth. So I do think that there is going to be a, a, a course correct. But the course correct is, is the volume of people coming, the behavioral pattern of consuming content on a regular basis. Now, the question is, and I think the point was made, you know, they're considering uh, they're consuming shorter pieces of content and smaller bursts of content over the course of the day. Um, but content is content. So the question is, is are you making better content, even if it's short form? And how much more emphasis is being put on that? And how much emphasis is being put on creating appropriate ad models for those environments? Because those environments don't speak to 30 second spots or even 15 second spots. And they might speak more into brand integration and other kind of things that are a little bit more uh, native for the environment. Let me ask this question, um, put it in this perspective, because I think the article did a really good job. The article that we're referencing for this story um, did a really good job of talking about what happens to an economy when most of the top companies are not actually making any product other than ad supported content. Um, it, it seems like that put that flips the funnel in an uneven way. It puts so much pressure on the system to stay profitable, the economy as a whole to stay you know, profitable based on ads as opposed to making stuff and selling it to consumers. Um, does that bother anybody? I mean, is anybody else concerned about that? Or is that just something that you know, is just a red herring, something that we shouldn't even worry about and is not really concerning? Uh, Dan, any thoughts on that? I, yeah, I think it depends on on when you look at you know, when you say top companies you know you're talking about facebook we're talking about google and a amazon which is a little bit of a different kind of a service we need we need of course any healthy economy has to have a balance of 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 companies that actually make things and 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 sell things and we can't just keep you know uh, uh having just you know be it, the top companies in the world be just content companies um so i don't know how out of whack that really is right now but of course the hype of course is with with facebook and google and and company you know new technology companies that are that are trying to make money from advertising i don't know if it's really uh skewing the gdp so radically that it's a problem but 
you know. Yeah, you I don't think anybody. Like I said, I don't you, think you'll that, have to go ahead. I'm I was going to say I don't think that anybody is is supp- is supposing that ma- that this this whole economy is has flipped on its head completely at this point. But there is a clear trend toward. Um, an emphasis on the ad supported model to the point where from what I was reading it goes from 1% of the GDP to 1.9% of the GDP potentially here in this year which is a rather significant increase in terms of it it doesn't sound like much on paper I mean we're only talking one percentage point but that's that's massive in terms of the seismic shift in gross domestic product Um, Julian what's your take on that is that any concern to you I mean, I wouldn't underestimate the reality that Google, Facebook, uh, you know, again, Amazon, you pointed out, slightly different uh, of a company, but are providing product and service and utility. It's just the product, service, and utility for the generation uh, of today. Um, So, you know, I don't know how much of a massive concern it is. And of course, at some point, uh, there is a scenario where there's only so much money to go around. It's certainly not infinite. Um, but I don't know that the prognostication that was in the article is 100 percent what's going to happen. And I do think that, you know, there are obviously uh, other products coming out from these companies that we're talking about. Uh, if you look at Facebook, you know, kind of uh, doing their video uh, tool that will be five hundred dollars a pop or whatever. They are trying to diversify their businesses, but using their core businesses as proxies to enable that. And I think there will be more of that coming along. So. You know, the utilities exist. And so the way that you're looking at it from an economic standpoint and the way that you're kind of centering in on a company's profit is a little different than relating it back to a CPG. And I think that that maybe is missed in the construct of the article. Mm, That's really, really good points. Good points all. Well, I want to move on. I want to talk next about the blockchain. Once again, we've talked about it many times on the show. And it's interesting how the blockchain is being positioned as an opportunity for online identity. And it's really kind of a great article that we're going to reference uh, from the New York Times. We're going to get to that in just a minute. But first, I want to do a sponsor read for us because these guys are paying the bills and they have a fantastic product because I, I don't know if anybody knows this. I mean, it's just like if you listen to the show, you've probably heard me say it before. I've been a creative in a past life. I was a copywriter and I know the pain firsthand of being told that's not our most updated logo or that's not the copy guidelines that have been approved or this is not what I was asking for from the image file. And, you know, consistency matters when it comes to marketing communications. You know, you need to have something that is a consistent source of authority on all of your images, all of your fonts, all of your logos, all of your brand guidelines. But how can you have consistency when it's strewn all over the Internet? That's why every brand within my hearing today, within my hearing, every brand within hearing range of my voice today needs to get an account with Brand Folder. Because Brand Folder is the easy way to store, manipulate, distribute, and track all of your digital assets from a single location. Now, did you know that the average creative wastes over 60 hours each year searching for misplaced brand assets? That's almost two weeks of productivity lost looking for needles in the haystack, digging through misplaced folders and old emails trying to find the most recent revisions and approvals. Brand Folder solves all this because it allows you to distribute approved brand assets publicly or privately, and it even provides in-app analytics so you can measure which assets are performing best in market. Companies like JetBlue, Slack, Under Armour, and thousands more use Brand Folder to provide a single source of truth for all things related to their brand equity, and your company can do it too. And I want you to go to this website because they're going to be doing you a favor they're going to be giving you the power of Brand Folder today um, absolutely free for 90 days. And I want you to go to this website. It's B-R-A-N-D-F-O-L-D-E-R, brandfolder.com slash beancast, and you'll unlock your free 90-day trial. That's brandfolder.com slash beancast to manage all of your digital assets from one location and set up your team for success in 2018. Brand Folder. Strong brands live here, and we thank them very much for their support of our show. Well, 
The New York Times Magazine has a fascinating piece on why Bitcoin itself is not the innovation, despite all the hype, despite people talking about people becoming billionaires over this uh, cryptocurrency, but rather the fact that it's an underlying technology uh, called the blockchain that is returning the user's identity back to them rather than needing to trust companies like Facebook to manage it for them. Now, Julian, could you give us a little bit of insight into why this is important and how it will affect marketers going forward? Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Sure. I, I, so I think the first thing is, is you know, if you read the article, you know, they talked a lot about how, you know, um, you need some enablement for people to kind of follow into that path of owning their identity. I think what you're going to have over the next 5, 10, 15 years with as much fraud that's happening in the digital environment and more and more people being affected by it, I think you'll have a natural kind of um, a natural kind of impact of people recognizing that they need to protect their digital presence in a much clearer fashion. And with as much kind of press as the cryptocurrencies are getting these days, more and more people will kind of investigate, understand, and start applying the technology, as you mentioned, blockchain, um, in, in a way that allows them to control their digital identity. What that, ha what that does uh, is, one, from the marketer standpoint, uh, I think marketing and the kind of advertising community will start obviously leveraging blockchain first in the programmatic world, um, you know, allowing for the, the, the lessening of the fraud that happens there. And I think over the course of time, people will take ownership of their identities. And I think it'll be a key initiative actually for government to start pushing regulations along those routes, because you're going to see these companies like Amazon and Facebook get to this trillion dollar mark, which is going to scare the hell out of governments, because at some point, those companies in the path that they're on will have will be worth more than the governments of most of the countries of the world. Well, let me and I think that's a scary mechanism for that to happen. Let me, let me clarify something. Let me ask you a question about that, because um, we've got a company like Facebook, and Facebook has all of our identity stored there. And essentially, the identity uh, belongs to us. We grant them the right to manage our identity, but still, they're using our identity to, to sell ads against us, and they're... They're using our identity for um, data mining and manipulation experiments and all kinds of things that we don't necessarily agree to. And that's the problem with having our corporate identity, I mean, our personal identity online being managed by a big company. It's not that they necessarily have evil intent, but they don't have our best interest and they certainly are not aligned with what we want to do every single time. So what kind of advantage does it give us to have that identity shifted back to the user? And how does that change business as a whole? Um, any thoughts on that, uh, Julian, Aaron, anybody? Well, Dan, I think... Dan, go ahead. Dan's no, 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 go ahead. No, I think that, you know, I think the industry by industry is going to need to figure out how to use this most effectively. You know, I've, I've seen a lot of talk about blockchain and a lot of different industries talk about the potential uses and then you know what is that what is it before we even get to marketing which is a, a different bubble it's like okay does this help global supply chains does this help honesty you know what problem does the blockchain solve what friction does it remove that's what we're going to really need to solve and i think it's different um for every industry and it's not just a matter of your personal identity it's it's you know does it does it encourage more global collaboration? You know, and is it truly trustworthy? We've seen, you know, we've seen Bitcoin get manipulated a lot. So, you know, what is the real advantage in this? But here, and here's the you here's can see the, a lot of people experiment with it for here's, sure. Here's the thing, though. It's just like the I love that part of the article where it says that um, Bitcoin is a a hundred billion dollar honey trap that has been around for over a decade and nobody's hacked it. I mean, you have manipulation of the currency itself, but the underlying technology, it's wide open. You know, if any hacker can go to this and potentially break into it and get $100 billion overnight and nobody's been able to do it. So if that's how strong the blockchain is uh, in terms of identity, well, uh, that changes the game in terms of how things are done on the Internet. Um, 
Well, I, I think I think you know what's important to recognize is that you know uh, who of us don't know or it, it, whether it's happened to them or don't know somebody that's had their Facebook hacked, that's had their Twitter hacked, or whatever it is. It happens, and I think the more and more that's happening, the more people are going to feel the urge, especially the generation coming up, to have some ownership of their identity. Because Facebook, in all fairness, depending on how you use it, doesn't actually provide as much depth into your identity as you may need to kind of execute certain things. Um, in other words, you're not banking through Facebook. You're not necessarily, at this point, uh, leveraging Facebook for your grocery shopping or things of that nature. Uh, that's more Amazon, obviously, with different kind of scenario. But in any instance, I think you're going to see with as much kind of concern and press as there is about hacking and all this other stuff, that consumers will start to figure out that controlling their own identity and controlling their, their digital footprint is as much of a necessity in life as having a lock on your front door. And once that starts to happen, people will take that control back and then figure out how to divvy out access to that to the companies that they want to grant access to on a limited rights basis. You know, one of the most interesting parts of this article for me was how this will affect business, Aaron, because, you know, when you're when you're Uber, you've locked a customer in with their data, with their credit card, with their payment information, with their um, personal ride history. And you're depending upon that user to log into your app and use your service because you own their identity. But when you change that power structure to the point where I own my identity and I can um, you know, choose where I want to apply it and what information I want to share with whom, then suddenly I can put out a call for a ride service that goes out to Lyft, Uber, the local cab service, and finds the best price almost instantaneously. And that changes the whole paradigm of business. How does that affect the pace of innovation? And does it make it less likely that companies will try to innovate uh, simply because they can't make the same level of profit on my identity anymore? Well, I'll make an analogy. And uh, I think all of us are probably old enough on this call to remember email. And email, when it first was made available <laughs> as a marketing tool to the people. Speak, speak for yourself. Great... <laughs> Sorry. Um, was the Wild West. And what that meant is if I got your email address, I could email until the cows came home. And that was great. And everybody now was a marketer and everybody could reach everybody because it didn't cost anything. And so what happened was... Uh, the government stepped in and then actually some of the businesses started to self-police and they put together these canned spam laws that said you can't do this anymore and businesses had to start taking responsibility for opting people in or opting them out if they were doing things that were illegal. But it didn't kill the email industry. I think a lot of people thought it would. What it did was it created a level of accountability. It did cut way back on a lot of the spam and you sort of push people in both directions where either you were a spammer or you weren't and you abided by the laws. And most of our spam does go into a folder that we never see anyway. But where I'm going with this is it forced companies, I think, to create a higher level of value so that if they wanted to have access to people, they needed to be able to give them content or you know control the frequency or give them the control they needed. And I think you're probably going to see some of that take place where companies that did rely on the fact they had all this information and really had you locked in are going to have to try that much harder to actually keep your business and to create that value that we talked about earlier. You know, something else that was in the article that, uh, that really struck me was the look at the structure of the internet as a whole and how it's evolved and where it is evolved badly and where it has evolved really, really well. And it, it took that juxtaposition between what happened with identity as opposed to what happened with the uh, the satellite geolocation services. Um, if that had not been turned out to be open source by the U.S. government to everybody to be able to use the service and access it, we would have had somebody launching satellites up there eventually, and everybody's location would be the property of something called Geobook or whatever happened to evolve from that. Um, and it makes me wonder, uh, is it too late for something like this to take hold? What, because it wasn't part of the foundational protocols of the Internet, 
does it make it so that there'll be too much resistance um, just through inertia of consumers and no desire from businesses to adopt these standards? Um, will it make things a little bit harder to swing in the favor of consumers? I mean, Julian, your thoughts on that? Well, I think the guiding principle is the consumer always gets screwed. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's an unfortunate reality, but sometimes that's the case. You know, look, I think it's an, it's an interesting, um, you know, point that they made and the example that they used with the kind of uh, the G, with GPS. Um, but I don't know if, if it's too foregone at this point. Uh, I think consumers tend to lean towards uh, comfort, uh, convenience, um, and, uh, and, and, the, and the devil they know. Um, and so if you take all those things into account, um, you know, the example that you brought up before with Uber is kind of hard uh, to see being executed effectively, right? So if I, you know, through the blockchain, I wanted to reach out and have, you know, a million people have access to the, the fact that I know that I'm going to be, you know, looking for a cab to go from midtown to downtown. Um, I think that there's, you know, there's a reason some of these things died, the location-based stuff died, because uh, people don't necessarily always want to give that information out. Um, I think that there's a lot of room to kind of evolve from where we are today. Um, I think that there's a significant opportunity for companies to come in and leverage new technologies to kind of open up consumers' access uh, to greater volumes of companies. But I do think that there's a limit to that as well. Um, and I do think that, you know, in the example with GPS, that you do, um, you know, I think creating that single monopoly probably isn't necessarily um, a reality in today's kind of regulated environment, but that, I guess that depends on who's in government, uh, and where the regulations stand and how, you know, varying governments will regulate and control, uh, some of these companies. You see the trouble that Uber's having in some of their places, Google's having in other countries, you know, countries are, are wary of some of these companies having too much power. And I think that's a real, you know, kind of barrier to, to that example. You know, it's it's interesting. You brought up a point that I, I find fascinating. Um, uh, is this in, in, in the exact antithesis of what I was trying to present, that it's somehow too late is not the problem. It's more that it's um, potentially a, an, an antitrust move. You know, it basically breaks the hegemony of Facebook and Google by allowing other players to come into the space. You know, it breaks the hegemony of Uber in the ride sharing space because it gives opportunity for new businesses to enter in and do something. Um, you know, I, that sounds pretty amazing, Dan, doesn't it? And is that a possibility that we can look forward to if this does take hold? Yeah, I think it's a possibility, but I think th I think what's going to happen is that it's the innovations that happen in blockchain are going to be B two B first, long before they're B two C. I think that you're going to see um, companies, whether they're you know global companies, whether they're doing uh, uh, you know business around the world, or they've got goods to move, they need their supply chains to be more honest. Uh, they're doing business in in com in countries that have less than stable governments. Uh, they're going to want this. I think consumers want things to be easy. They want the interfaces to be simple. And I think that it's that's the, that's going to be down the road. I think any sort of blockchain innovation that helps you and me uh, get a ride downtown is going to be a little off in the future. I think that the, the the things that blockchain can solve right now or in the next few years will be less sexier than that. Mm, mm. Well, interesting conversation, guys, but I want to move on next and talk about YouTube trying to prove that they are safe, finally, finally, but killing a lot of niche players along the way. We'll tell you all about that in just a minute. But next, I want to talk about our sponsor, Prezi. Did you know that the average person sits through nearly 21,000 hours of slide presentations during their career? Now that's 21,000 hours. Sit with that for a minute. And even if 10% of them are any good, and we all know that's a complete stretch because even 10% of them being good is an outlandish figure, you still have to spend 19,000 hours being absolutely bored to tears. Now don't let death by PowerPoint suck the life out of you too, because we've got a better idea. Put Prezi to work in your office. 
because the same great interactive cloud-based presentation platform that is so popular with educators is now finally available in a business version, complete with team collaboration and analytics built right in, and it's already gaining a reputation as the must-have tool among the best business presenters in the market today. Look, I have seen a lot of presentations, as you have, I'm sure. And I can honestly say that I have never seen a boring Prezi presentation. And that's because instead of slides, you organize information on a single open canvas, allowing you to quickly pan to and zoom in on the information you want for the most dynamic, visually stunning presentations you're going to see everywhere. Anywhere, sorry. Um, even independent researchers at Harvard found in a double-blind study that Prezi was more engaging, more persuasive, and more effective than PowerPoint, which, when we translate that into English, means that Prezi presentations are simply the best way to get your clients to buy because you're not boring them to death. And right now, you can get Prezi for business for free, so there's absolutely no reason not to give it a try. At least give it a try. So I want you to go to Prezi.com slash Beancast. That's P-R-E-Z-I dot com slash Beancast. And you're going to get two weeks to try it for free. And as a bonus for Beancast listeners, they're even going to throw in an exclusive design pack worth more than $20 absolutely free with no obligation. So go to P-R-E-Z-I dot com slash Beancast right now. That's Prezi.com slash Beancast. Presentations are just a fact of life and business, but boredom does not have to be. Wake up your presentations with Prezi, and we thank them very much for their support of our show. Well, YouTube's efforts to ensure brands are safe to run ads has led to a kind of circling of the wagons around the top 5% of content publishers on the platform, while cutting loose the majority of other niche publishers from ever having enough audience to warrant ads showing up in their videos in the first place. So, Aaron, does this make advertising safer? I mean, or is this the right move for YouTube, or does it have way too many negative consequences for them going down the line? What are your thoughts on this? Well, when I read the article, I had a few different thoughts. One is I feel like this is a PR move on YouTube's uh, case because of the fact that um, I think the example in the article was a fairly well-known YouTuber, 15 million followers, um, showed the body, uh, you know, just post the suicide. Um, and, and the concern is, is that, you know, content or advertising content shows up next to that. The ir irony there is, is that this is one of the people that theoretically they're trying to court. So really <laughs> by getting out the small guys, that doesn't really uh, take care of it. Now, that said, we do know that it probably is um, a little bit of a nuisance and a little bit of ankle biting to have to deal with you know, some of the smaller players. And I do believe that YouTube is trying to make the upstream push toward being more like a Hulu or a Netflix, some of these streaming services. So I kind of wonder if that's a little bit at play. And then realistically, they probably also realize that a lot of, you know, some of the smaller uh, folks are pushing into places like Instagram, where you have sort of the built-in social, a little more natively wrapped around it, certainly Snap uh, or Snapchat rather. Uh, and then even Facebook Live, where I think, you know, you're starting to be able to let people know where I know that, you know, you can build a following in YouTube. It's not nearly as social in nature as some of those other apps are. So, you know, that's kind of what my initial thinking was when I saw that. I don't know as though it's a great idea to kick out the people that got you there, the, you know, sort of smaller creators. But in the end, I think it's a move they're trying to make that's probably less to do with what they called it, more to do with wanting to be more upstream. And at the end of the day, a lot of these folks are going to go and just move on to other platforms anyway. Do you agree with that, Julian? I mean, is this like, is this mainly a PR move from their part to try to push upstream and get that reputation that they're a safe platform for big advertising dollars to be spent? Or is this potentially problematic going down the line because they're cutting off their innovation pipeline. They're cutting off the opportunity for new stars to make a little money, get the bug, and become uh, eventually part of that 5%, you know, amazing circle of great content. So um, I think it's a little bit PR, but in a little bit uh, a reaction of what happened to them over the last year and a kind of a course correction that they had to make if they were to retain any kind of advertisers. There are still large advertisers, I can think of one off the top of my head, that I know have yet to kind of come back to YouTube 
uh, from the issues that's you know that came over the summer or, or whenever that time frame was when you know the ads showed up in front of jihadi kind of videos. So I think it's a reactionary move as much as it is a PR move. Um, and in terms of the creators, well, I don't know how much of a general impact this has on creators because I think people still are getting access to a platform to get free distribution uh, to the degree that they're not necessarily making money off of it. I don't know that most people really think about how much money they're going to make on YouTube until that money starts actually coming in. Um, so I'm not sure how much of an impact it, it truly has on, on the creators. I do think, however, what this does do to a degree is, and I think uh, this was just said, it opens up an opportunity for other platforms to kind of give uh, consumers um, an, an environment from which they can actually create content. So if you're thinking about, you know, of course, Instagram was mentioned, and that's one of them, and Snap. But I actually think you're going to see a lot of the traditional um, content companies, your Viacoms, your, you know, your, your NBCs, your CBSs, et cetera, really start to embrace kind of figuring out how to engage with users in a much more cohesive manner to kind of help uh, facilitate users being and fans being more active and creating content for them as well. Um, so I think this does potentially open up some kind of window for that scenario. But I, I genuinely think this was a direct reaction to the fact that they were kind of losing uh, advertiser confidence in a platform um, versus the concern that they might have as it relates to, you know, uh, the, the creators actually losing out on, you know, a 10 or $20 paycheck that they might get over the course of a year if they don't have enough uh, followers to begin with. You know, the word reactionary resonates with me. Um, I'm wondering, is this an, even enough, what they're doing? Um, they, they're essentially cutting off the ads to a majority of their lower paying uh, creators, lo lower volume creators. They're circling the wagons around the top 5%. But even if they circle the wagon around the top 5% and try to protect that nest egg of most of their revenue and hiring lots and lots of people to view videos by hand or by sight, I don't know how you say that, um, you know, is that enough? Is that something that's even feasible? I mean, Dan, um, what are your thoughts on that? Is that something that is you know, even possible for YouTube to, to prove to advertisers? Probably not. I think that, you know, there's always a risk when you're an advertiser and you don't know what you're advertising on. And we know that if you want to, I think what was said earlier, I totally agree with, with Aaron and Julian, you know, people are going to go, um, if they can't, if they can't see their, any revenue out of YouTube, they're going to go somewhere else. They're going to look for some other opportunity. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know that uh, people are going to, you know, YouTube, the beauty of it is that it's just easy. It's easy to get on there. It's easy to distribute. It's easy to to um, to share. And somebody somewhere can can replicate that, not not with not a lot of degree of difficulty. And that may attract all these folks, this bottom 95 percent, if uh, if they're looking for some 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 money. But um, if that happens, you still end up with the same problem on another platform. You know, some other platform is going to inherit YouTube's problems, which is that there are always bad eggs in any kind of content pool who are creating jihadi videos or trading. Well, you know, that's the risk. You know, if if companies wa companies want to spread their their but their ad budget around and and take advantage of wherever the you know you got to you fish where the where where the fish are, and you you know that's a that's a risk you know it was it was going back to the beginning of advertising you want to know where you're what you're spending your money on um is you know. let me we've debated this so many times on the show Aaron there's just, there's no end of episodes where we've debated this but I mean, one more time is it even safe to do programmatic advertising in any sense on you know on any platform uh, and should brands always be thinking twice before they start initiating some kind of programmatic campaign? Well, this is Aaron. I'll jump in. I think it uh, depends on what brand you are. If you're a brand like, you know, GoDaddy, who cares? Because you're not, your brand is inherently irreverent, right? And I think there are a lot of other mid-sized brands that care less than others. If you're Disney, 
Uh, if you're, you know, Fidelity Investments, where I used to work, I know they were incredibly careful about how they come through their, you know, they, they actually, early days of programmatic would be very methodical about not joining certain networks because there were, you know, there was chaff along with the wheat. So I think it, it all depends. Um, certainly the more premium, premium brands or the brands that really care about their reputation will start to really shy away. And the ones that say, I'll take any comers, you know, and our brand is irreverent enough, we don't care, then, you know, I think you're going to see that kind of a bifurcation. Uh, if I may, um, if you are a brand today that doesn't understand what programmatic means, you have a different issue than what I'm about to say. There's no reason why you can't use programmatic. There's a difference between the construct of leveraging a technology for data and addressability and targeting versus necessarily just going out and buying open exchange random inventory. So brands need to understand how the technology is leveraged, what it means, and how they use it tactically. You could do PMPs with top level publishers. That's programmatic. That doesn't mean that you're running across terrible content. So I do think that, you know, as long as brands understand what programmatic is and what it means and how they leverage it for their business, there's no reason and there's no concern in leveraging programmatic. Now, if brands um, are simply going to just go into the open web or the into the uh, use programmatic, just using open exchange inventory, and are just going to kind of pray and spray even in the the kind of programmatic world, even with targeting, then of course that there has to be some uh, some thought process behind that, some concern with doing that, and some understanding of how uh, that might not necessarily be the best for their brands. And you're right, you know, certain brands will have less concern than others. But again, it's really understanding what the technology is, how it is leveraged, and what it means, um, and how you know you use it to your advantage as a marketer. Well, I want to move on to our final topic of the evening. Right now, it's Thursday night football in play. Facebook has already taken a pass, and Amazon has not said if they will rebid for the 2018 streaming rights. But damn... Should we take this lackluster enthusiasm that's going on right now at face value, or is the NFL more important to the future of television than many may realize? What's your take on the situation right now with the streaming rights and also the long-term potential of the NFL maybe moving entirely from TV to the online space? Yeah, I think uh, the answer to both of those questions you asked is, is basically yes. Um, first off, let's talk about Thursday night football. I think you have to look at that as an outlier because within the league, it's been criticized. You know, the players and coaches hate it because it doesn't give them enough time to recover from previous Sunday games and prepare for the next one. So what you do is you what I've what I've been hearing from a lot of a lot of uh things that I've read and, and seen is that the play calling gets more conservative. You get an inferior product and a higher likelihood of injury. So Thursday night football has been a problem. And also when you when you talk about Amazon's uh, coverage of it this year, if you look at Amazon, uh, you go online and look at the reviews for Thursday night football, not necessarily the games, but just the experience, they're largely negative. A lot of one-star reviews about the quality of the experience. So you I know have, how to, right I know now, how they, they can still have some things to 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 work out. I know how they can and, improve it. They can have Corden Tish come on and uh, do the uh, <laughs> announcement for them. I don't know. It's an inside joke. I don't know if everybody saw Corden Tish, but God, that was funny. But go ahead, Dan. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. You know, and absolutely live TV. You know, for the networks right now, the NFL is huge for them, and it has to be. And they can't lose. They can't afford to lose that audience because live sports. Uh, are one of the things that attracts eyeballs in real time and keeps them fairly captive for for advertisers and sponsors and all that. So they, you know, and I think a lot of it is pretty locked down for the future. So I, the networks can't afford to really lose um, that audience on Sundays and Mondays. I think I think Thursday night. I don't know if there's a future in it, but um, you know, for for you know what what the rest of the people are watching as we are talking right now, the NFC championship. I mean, uh, you know, I think, uh, unless the experience improves online and I'm sure it will, um, the network, you know, it, it's, it's key for a network audience. Now I know Julian, you've got some opinions about this cause we talked about it this week. What are your thoughts? Yeah. Well, look, uh, and I think, uh, you know, Aaron made a great point. Uh, Thursday night is a little bit of an anomaly, uh, both with the quality of the product, the, the 
the fact that it's in the middle of the week on a Thursday with people going out and all these other things. So uh, I do think Thursday's in a little, little bit of anomaly. Um, I certainly think, and you know, Bob, how I feel about this. You know, I'm hesitant to get into my full thoughts on it, but I will tell you that I, I firmly believe uh, that the NFL is the key to the television market. Um, I don't think that's a surprise to anybody, and I think that inherently there are going to be some significant changes that happen over the next two to four years that will kind of really be a bellwether for how the general kind of television, and when I say television, I'm including the constructs of streaming and all these other things, how it evolves for consumers over the course of the next four, you know, four or five years, and the NFL is the singular key to that. Um, and so within that, you know, do I concern myself with Facebook not necessarily bidding on it? Well, I don't think that they specifically have a fantastic infrastructure to support that. So I understand them backing out because if you look at what's happened with Watch, it's just not the consumer experience that people are used to on the platform or that people maybe are looking for at this point in time on that platform. So them bowing out doesn't necessarily indicate anything. Um, I think the question is going to be who are the companies that are going to bid on it? Because to your point, you know, the reviews on Amazon were not necessarily positive. The reviews on Twitter the year before were actually generally positive. So I think, you know, you're going to have, you know, a lot of companies that have to kind of adjust how they have been, you know, um, providing consumer experience for live entertainment, specifically sports. And there's going to be significant changes to, you know, UI and, and consumer experience on that front. Um, but I'm not concerned about Facebook backing out because I just don't think they're even in a position um, on any level to actually support that and make it a good user experience. And I think they know that. Well, with that, it's time for the Ad Fail 5. But before we get to that segment of the show, I do want to take this quick opportunity to thank my guests again and allow them to each do a shameless plug, starting with Dan Goldgeier. You can find him at dangoldgeier.com. Uh, you can find there all his books. You can find out how to work with him. You can find out all kinds of information, but I'm going to let Dan take it away. What would you like to promote, Dan? Yeah, absolutely. If you want to work with me, with for if you need copywriting or strategy, uh, get in touch with me. I also have a book called Killer Executions and Scrubbed Decks, the an outside-the-box look at obnoxious advertising and marketing jargon. It's available on Amazon, and all proceeds go to Feed My Dog. <laughs> Fantastic. And I, I, is your dog well fed at this point or is still? He, well, we got, we got a residual check that'll keep him fed for about a few days. So, <laughs> you know, get back and reorder, folks. He, Murphy's going to go hungry. Please. Now, next up, we have Aaron Strout. You can find him at WTOgroup.com. That's the place where he is the chief marketing officer. Tell us what's going on in your world, Aaron, and what would you like to promote? Sure. I think the thing I'm most excited about right now is I'm doing a uh, podcast. So, you know, we can be complimentary here and not competitive, but it's called the What to Know podcast. Uh, it's on iTunes, Stitcher, and um, uh, uh, Spotify. And you can also find it on the w2ogroup.com, uh, which is our website and uh, also our blog content. We really have sort of an unprecedented amount of great content if you're keeping up with uh, integrated marketing and communications. So, those would be the two I would love to pitch. Oh, fantastic. That sounds great. And uh, definitely we, we share the love here when it comes to podcasting. Uh, and finally, Julian Zilberbrand. You can find him at Viacom.com. Uh, tell us what's going on in your world, Julian. What would you like to promote? Well, I would love to promote the launch of the new Paramount Network that launched this past Thursday. Spike has become the Paramount Network. There's a tremendous amount of high-quality content that's going to be coming out. Uh, so I encourage everybody to watch. And, of course, please watch all of our television networks because I like to eat and occasionally I even <laughs> like to buy some clothes. So please watch television. It's not all digital. Watch some television. Relax. Lean back on your couch and make sure that I get to eat for the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah, feed Julian. He needs food. And Absolutely. I, and uh, on that note, I need food as well. So for more information about me or the show, visit thebeancast.com. There you can find a complete show archive. You can find out how to consult with me. That's how I will eat. And you can even find out how to advertise in the program. That's how I will eat even more. So check it all out at thebeancast.com. And now it's time for the Ad Fail 5, a rundown of the lowest moments in advertising, marketing, and public relations from the last week. And first up... 
This one struck me as odd. Amazon Alexa, sorry, said it, probably set off a whole bunch of devices, just got added to a unique place, Aaron. The Amazon Alexa app on Android phones. Can you believe that they had an Amazon Alexa app that didn't have Alexa built into it? <laughs> what was the deal with that? I, I don't know. And, and, you know, I just added Alexa to our uh, house uh, a few weeks ago and love it. But I think sometimes you're just so focused on the external stuff, you miss the things that are right in front of you. I read that and I was somewhat incredulous that they missed out on that opportunity. So I don't really know what to say, but it was uh, it was definitely a boner on their part. <laughs> now, next up, according to Apple CEO, iPhone addiction is not their problem, Julian. He instead passed the buck to social media because that's always a good PR strategy, right? Just blame the other guy, pass the buck down the line, take no absolute, uh, take no credit for this uh, potential problem. <laughs> well, to, to some extent, I tend to agree with him. Uh, and frankly, I like to blame the social media networks for everything anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Now, upscale retail, British retail store Harvey Nichols got into the... Um, uh, got into a little bit of heat with an ad display that claimed great men go down. And now, I don't know, Dan. I mean, you're a copywriter. How does this make you a better dresser? I mean, I'm not sure exactly yeah, it, what, know, what the it, connection it, with. I mean, I know that the, the complaints were all about the fact that if this was a woman with this in this picture, it would have been like incredibly sexist. But because it's a man, it's OK. But I think that it overlooks the point where, like, what does this have to do with anything? <laughs> Fashion is its own own fickle beast when it comes to work, copy and, and, and advertising. So uh, it may be a feature, not a bug for, for a brand like that. Now, Coke thought it was being a responsible corporate citizen by encouraging more recycling of its plastic bottles, Julian. Unfortunately, if they had listened, they would have learned that what environmentalists, what environmentalists really wanted was less of the bottles to begin with. You know, this is one of those things where you go, we're just going to do something that's going to be really great. It's going to show our great corporate citizenry. And instead, it just opens up a can of worms because you're just not paying attention. <laughs> It, it's a classic kind of attempt by a large company to, to you know, uh, acquiesce to a large vocal audience without really listening to what they're actually you know, trying to, you know, convey as a message. It's more reactionary stuff by large corporations. And finally, a uh, European cosmetic company, Wicon, seem to have missed the whole H&M memo about racist promotions here, Dan. Releasing a black nail polish with the headline, and I apologize for this, my friends, I do not like saying this, but the headline was Thick as a Nigga. Um, I'm like, who thinks that this is a good copy line to put on any product? <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of quality control lacking across the board, and, and I don't even know that it would be a cultural issue. It, it certainly is a big problem you know, in America. It's probably a problem over there, but uh, as we saw with the H&M thing, somebody's just not paying attention. A, a lot of people are just not paying attention, and you know, a localized mistake goes around the world pretty fast. Well, That's just dumb. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this one's a really bonehead move. Well, have something to add to this list or just want to discuss it, comment online, use the hashtag AdFail5. That's pound, AdFail, and the number five. Well, that does it for this week's show. If you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, visit our website at thebeancast.com and click on the subscribe link. If you're an iTunes listener, we've also provided a direct link to the iTunes Music Store or just search for The Beancast in the podcast directory of iTunes. And whichever podcast directory you use, when you subscribe, please leave us a review. Got a comment? Have a question? We'd love to hear from you. Just send your emails to beancast at gmail.com. Opening theme was performed by Joe Seibel. Closing theme by C. Jax. Thanks for listening. I'm Bob Norp. We'll be back again next week. Hope you'll join us then.
it's like, it's like, I don't know, like if it's, you know, it's like, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's just like kind of, it just seems like it's just like almost exactly.